The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 731 for Monday, October 15th, 2018. <laughs> Welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where we take your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found. We mix it all together. And the goal is that each and every one of us learns five new things. Topics on the list today include some APFS troubles, explanations about Wi-Fi and what matters with the new version numbers and how to translate them. And some great stuff from our forums. Sponsors for this episode include BB Edit from Barebone Software, LinkedIn.com slash MGG, where you can get 50 bucks off your first job post, and Captera.com slash MGG, where you can join the millions of people who use Captera to find software each month. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in, boy, it's starting to get chilly, Fairfield, Connecticut, this is... Yeah, it's fall. I love it. It's uh, the air is crisp. It gets cool at night. It's good sleeping weather. Have, it's time to have fires and like, you know, enjoy the smell of smoke. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. It's good. It's good. Well, For me, it's a chance to get new technology. I uh, saw a tweet. The uh, so I follow Z-Wave. Uh, as sure. some of you probably know, Z-Wave is a protocol for things to talk to each other and uh, become part of your smart home. And and I saw a tweet and they're like, hey, maybe you should get a Z-Wave thermostat. So I dug around and uh, found one and it's on the way and we'll uh, see how that works out. Yeah, I'm curious about uh, about that. I've I've used the Ecobee thermostat. I've used the Nest thermostat, but those are both Wi-Fi thermostats. And uh, and so I'm curious how the how Z-Wave works and you said yours is going to be battery powered because you don't have a lot of smart thermostats. This is an important thing for for everybody who's thinking about a smart thermostat to um, to consider. A lot of smart thermostats require they need to be powered somehow. Right. Um, and so they mm -hmm. some of them require what's called a C wire, which is, I think, 24 volts DC. Uh, right. Right. Coming usually usually, but not always coming from your. Uh, you know, your your boiler, or your furnace or whatever it is, uh, you certainly can get, uh, a, you know, a 24 volt DC uh, from AC adapter and and plug it in the I, I, I have never done that because with our power outages here, I don't want to have my thermostat uh, dependent on power separate from my boiler. I want if the boiler gets power, if somehow I can get power to the boiler, I want my thermostat to work. So, uh, but we have in, in our house, we have a couple of C wired. We have four zones in the house and, and two here in the office and in the house, two of the zones have, uh, have the C wire. Ecobee requires the C wire. I believe the Honeywell thermostats require it, but don't quote me on that, even though I've recorded this. So I'm definitely going to be quoted on that. The ones that I saw at Home Depot, at least one of them said, oh, well, um, yeah, you can get a, you know, we, you, you need a C wire, but you can also get a C wire adapter, which right. is basically, as you said, a 24 volt. Uh, so wall <laughs> Nest, Nest would prefer a C wire, but Nest will do something called power stealing where, you know, the, the other two wires that come into your, your very rudimentary, you know, thermostat setup uh, do have 24 volts passing across them. The trick is that when you short them together, it opens the valve and or does whatever it needs to do to right. start the, you know, the heating process. Um, the nest that I have in the studio, we only have two wire uh, here in the studio in the office and it that works really well. Um, it's it's actually Im impressive. I mean, I've had this nest here for several years. There's a lot of things about the nest I don't like. It's really not applicable to a home in an area where it's cold. Uh, it's more applicable to an area where it's temperate and we can have that conversation at another time. But, uh, but the nest works really well with the, the power stealing. So, um, uh, so there you go. But yeah, I'm, I'm curious to find out about your, uh, your, uh, your upcoming thermostat there, man. That's fun stuff. Yeah. And also it, uh, 
it was like uh at the time i got it the the price wavers but uh 60 bucks cool i don't know if i'm i don't know if uh yeah i mean the nest is what like 200 bucks or something i don't know if i yeah pay that much for a thermostat <laughs> uh it depends on i you know i i'm very the, the nest in the studio here it, it it having a smart thermostat in the studio is awesome uh, because I can set a schedule and match it, you know, our, our podcasting, my podcasting schedule, I recorded three different shows. It, you know, it, it varies all the time. So having something that I can program and, and say, okay, here's what next week's schedule looks like. I can open up a web browser and say, doo, 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 and boom, I'm good to go. Right. Um, oh, which is nice. Yeah, e- exactly. Or here's when band practice is going to be. And so I want the temperature different for that because if I go too hot before brand band practice, uh, and then you put, you know, five sweaty guys in the room it, that that gets uncomfortable. Right. So it it that part of it's great. The problem with the Nest is that Nest actually makes it very difficult to do exactly that. Um, it wants to be really, really smart uh, for you. And and it wants to think for you. And th- that just doesn't a- apply. I guess we're having a conversation now that just doesn't apply when you live in an area where it gets cold. You you don't need a thermostat to think for you. You've already figured that out. You know how your house works and you want to be able to participate in that process. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, so anyway, uh, Nest works great in temperate environments where maybe you haven't learned, ha- you haven't had to, you haven't had a financial incentive to obsess and figure out how the heat flow in your house works. Uh, but like if we hadn't figured if, you know, I mean, if you didn't know how the heat flow in your house worked in living in new England, you would, um, it would cost you a few grand a year in inefficient heating practices. So that's why I like the eco bee in the house because it's built, it was built by people in Toronto and it really does reflect that in its user experience. But the next can be dumbed down. It just takes a lot of hard work to get it there. But anyway, uh, I want to talk about some stuff from our forums here, John, because uh, we had some great discussions in our forums this week first. And so we've got some questions and tips and, and you know, great content. Uh, first, though, I want to sponsor Barebones software at barebones.com. They make the award winning venerable still doesn't suck after all these years. BB edit text editor. And this is a piece of software that is always running on all of my Macs. And I know that seems crazy, but I'm using it constantly. Yes, I use it for some coding. Uh, but what's really cool is, I, you know, it, integ- it integrates in every way from a coding standpoint, right? We have some of our stuff where we store it in Git repositories where they are, uh, it allows for version control. And BB Edit, of course, works perfectly with that. But also there are some things that I just edit live on the server. And I know I shouldn't do that. Uh, I've been doing it for 20 years. Uh, It's only burned us a few times, but here's the cool part, right? BB edit allows me to open direct over FTP or SFTP, however I want to connect. And then when I edit and I hit command S, if it was opened locally on my drive, it saves it locally. If it was opened over FTP, command S just saves it across the, the network link. There's no... Like there's no fanfare to it. It just works. It's really awesome. And of course it has, you know, many, 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 many levels, uh, almost unlimited, I think, levels of undo so that when I do make a mistake, I can roll back pretty easily with just another couple of command Zs and a command S. So that, there it works. But I also use it just to count words and documents and uh, compare to text documents. You can launch it from the terminal. So you're not having to use like arcane terminal editors. You know, we argue VI versus Emacs. Well, you could do that and that's fun. Don't get me wrong. I like that. But as soon as you say VI versus Emacs versus BB edit, well, there's no competition anymore. The Holy war is over. You just use BB edit. So you got to check it out. Go to bare bones, Dot com and our thanks to Barebones for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, uh, let's let's go and let's talk about uh, a post in our forums from Mister Hooks here. Mister Hooks uh, asked asked several questions, and one of them was uh, I, I'll say it's a he since we're calling you Mister Hooks. Uh, says lastly, I hate the translucent menu bar. Some versions of Mac OS ago. It used to be optional. Now that no longer appears to be the case. Uh, 
He says, is there any way to turn that off? Uh, and so the, the, the trick is you used to, if you went into system preferences doc, uh, sorry, system preferences desktop and screensaver, you used to be able to turn off just menu bar translucency. Uh, however, that's gone, as Mr. Hooks astutely notes. But if you go into system preferences, accessibility, display, reduce transparency is there. And that will stop the menu bar, but also the dock from being transparent or translucent and, and all of that. But, uh, but you can do it. There's also some other cool things here. If you go into that, uh, you know, again, it's system preferences, accessibility, display. There is uh, invert colors which gives you, it's not smart invert like it is on iOS. It is dumb invert. Pictures get inverted too. But this can be really handy, uh, especially for those of you that either, for whatever reason, don't want to use dark mode or aren't yet on Mojave or can't be on Mojave. But you want to approximate dark mode for those scenarios where, say, you're in a dark room and taking some notes or whatever. Invert colors can make a really... Uh, it, it can, I mean, it, you know, it, it, it takes everything on your screen that's white and turns it black and vice versa. So, you know, you, you can really reduce that that blue glow that sort of happens when you're using a laptop in a darkened room with that invert colors thing. And you can also turn on use grayscale, too, which uh, can Jeff Gamut swears that that helps uh, helps battery life and and some glare and stuff, too. So. So anyway, there you go. Good stuff in the forums. We like it. What do you think, John? Uh, what I think is, um, so the question was, is there a way for me to affect uh, some of the visual effects in the Finder? And there kind of is. So I, I look to, uh, you probably know what program I'm going to mention here. I but do. For those that want to modify some of these things, our pal Onyx lets you do that. So they have a parameters tab, and then they have, under that, there's a general tab. That, um, and I'm even looking now, it has one option here, show graphic effects when opening a window, and you can turn that on and off. And it also has a finder tab, but I don't believe it lets you modify that, the exact. The that was the first place I looked to. And, and yeah, there's lots of options there, but that's not one of them, which tells me that there's probably not a, you know, defaults write command from the terminal that you can use to do this because that's all Onyx is doing for, for all of those user interface tweaks is essentially, you know, flipping those switches without you having to go to the terminal and do it. But yeah, yeah, I know. So they took it away from us. Hmm. They took it away. Yeah. Which is weird. I mean, it's, but it's still there. Like you, but you, you the dock in, <clears throat> excuse me, inherits the same, uh, the same setting, which is, I don't know, whatever, you know, infinite wisdom of, of Apple, I suppose. Uh, all right. Also here in, uh, in our forums, we had a question from bamboozle who was, uh, was having an issue with contacts permissions. And, and the issue is, he says, when I go to settings, privacy contacts, I can't see the apps that have access to my contacts, but the whole screen is kind of grayed out. And I can't make any changes there. I also can't allow new apps to access my contacts. Is there another setting I have to enable first? And uh, and he said, uh, he said, well, actually, Graham McKay answered the question. He says, uh, these symptoms sounds exactly the same as how my iPhone looks. Is if I have gone into settings, screen time, content and privacy restrictions, contacts, don't allow. So flipping that uh, off or if it were, you know, it, it, sometimes a setting needs to be toggled, you know, 360 degrees, right? You turn it off, turn it back on again, turn it on, turn it off again, whatever it is, get it back to its original state. It relight, rewrites that plist file and everything's OK. And that did it. So this is really interesting that not only do we have like privacy settings, but inside screen time. We have content and privacy privacy restrictions there. And then, of course, parental controls can do the same thing. So this gets interesting, John. Yet another place to dig. I never would have thought to go there. So I, this is, you know, I say we each learn five new things. That is uh, that is most definitely true. Craziness, huh, Mr. Braun? 
I'm scratching my head why they put certain things where they do. In yeah. Our yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you. Content and privacy restrictions. Look at this. And there it is. Contacts. Oh man. There's so much here. Ah, thanks Apple. Cool. Hey, that's what the forum, that's what we love about our, our forums is, you know, there's so many smart people and uh, we can all help each other and we can all participate in the conversations are there and they're archived and, oh yeah, it's good. It's good. It's delicious. Uh, another one from the forums, my friend, Mr. Braun, uh, is from Niceville Steve, who asks, uh, do you know if a person consumes more data connecting to an external device versus than using an iPhone alone? And he's asking about personal hotspots. So do, do you wind up using more data if, say, you connect your iPad to your iPhone for personal hotspot than if your iPhone or if your iPad were just connected to uh, cellular data directly? And, and the answer is, yeah, it's totally possible because we have settings on our iOS devices where we can say, don't let this app talk uh, over cellular data, but it will still talk over Wi-Fi data. Well, the problem comes in when you do personal hotspot from any of your devices, those restrictions don't apply because the device that's asking for it thinks it's on Wi-Fi, right? So that whole, you know, app updates over 150 megs, those limitations don't happen when you're on personal hotspot. Uh, it, it is, it is a non restrictive scenario once you're, once you're there, which can be a nice little hack, right? I mean, we've heard from some of you that have said, oh yeah, I needed to update the such and such app while I was out, couldn't do it, but you know, I was with my husband. And so I turned on hotspot on his phone and downloaded my update. And then we flip flop back and forth and I turned on hotspot on mine and he was able to download the update. Like that's a nice little hack, but there is like no way to avoid that if you, if you don't want it. So yes, you can easily use more data when your device thinks it's on Wi-Fi than, uh, than when it's actually using its own cellular signal. Um, if you're connecting your Mac to one of these devices, or if you're just connecting your Mac and you want to limit data usage, there's an app called Trip Mode that will do exactly this kind of thing. And you can really use it to tweak. I, I long before Trip Mode came out, I started using Little Snitch to do this, but and, and it works because you can have it automatically change per connection or you can manually change the profiles. And so I built a little snitch profile that does this. But boy howdy, it like it's a bear to create that and, and set it all up because it's all very, very manual. Whereas trip mode has done a lot of the hard work for you. So we will put a link to trip mode in the, uh, in the show notes too. Thoughts on any of this, Mr. Braun? Nah, uh, not really. I'm, okay. I'm with you on this. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't it, had to use it too much, but yes, you, you are correct. Is that, uh, yeah, I was just picturing it in my mind here is that it's Wi-Fi to, to anything. Wi-Fi to hotspot. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Coolio. All right. Uh, we will go, we will stick in the forums. We got two more from the forums, I think. So this one comes from Appleseed, who says, I have a friend with a strange duplicate track problem that has developed over the past few months. Three computers slash devices are involved, a Mac, an iPhone, and an iPad. Typically, she buys music on her iPhone, uh, running on iOS 12, but this has happened prior and plays it from both her iPhone and iPad. Auto download music feature is turned on on both under Apple ID, iTunes, and App Stores. Okay. For instance, she just bought an album from the iTunes Music Store. On her phone, she sees every track duplicated. If she plays the album, the tracks do indeed play twice. But on her iPad, only the first three tracks are duplicated. The rest of the album are single tracks. She has never subscribed to Apple Music or had iTunes Match or iCloud Music Library turned on as far as she knows. One possible complication is that her old iPad is maxed out at iOS 9.3.5. So this is odd. And, and I, can, I can speak to this a little bit because I have an old iPad that lives in my mixer. We use a Mackie uh, DL1608, I guess, is the mixer. I can't remember the model number over the to off the top of my head, but we'll put a link in the show notes, which uses an iPad in it, and you can play music from the iPad. 
and just this week I loaded some tracks on to Apple music and, uh, and it worked, it worked great. Like it synced to the, it, it didn't do any duplication. So I can tell you this is not happening because of that. And it's certainly obviously not supposed to happen, but, um, yeah, this is, this is interesting. Like, why is it duplicating these tracks? So you, John, this is like you, right? You don't have Apple music, right? And, and so you haven't used iCloud music library. Uh, I wonder, mm -hmm. like I'm I trying don't to have any duplicates either. And you don't have any duplicates. Yeah. I like, it feels like what's happening is her phone is I, like, I would wonder what happens if you buy the tracks on the iPad, right? And then, you know, does, does any of it get duplicated? I think that's what you, that that's where we have to sort of head down this path, right? Is test and see is where the problem begins. Because without iCloud music library or Apple music or, you know, iTunes match involved, there's no syncing happening between these. The only thing is that you're telling it to auto download whatever you've purchased. And I would also watch that purchase process to see if perhaps there's, you know, something in the workflow that, that she's doing where she's tapping twice on something or I like, I, I don't know, but that's, um, I would, I would use the troubleshooting process and, and start, you know, try it from a different Avenue. Does the auto download cause this problem? If auto download is turned off on one or both devices, what happens? Does, you know, is auto download causing this issue? Like what's the, what's the trick? Any other thoughts, my friend? Uh, I mean, there is an article here called delete music, movies and TV shows from your device from Apple. And they offer, uh, doesn't look to be very useful. It's pretty much if you see a duplicate, delete it. Uh, right. <laughs> right. I was just going to say what, what's the trick there? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know. Uh, yeah. I don't know if this has any additional wisdom. Right. There right. are also some, uh, I mean, if you search for iTunes, remove duplicates, there appear to be some, uh, no, nothing from any company that I'm familiar with. But I don't think she's do seeing duplicates you. on her Mac. Right. I mean, this is just, this is yeah. on iOS. So yeah. Oh man. It's interesting. You can visit the forums at MacGeekab.com slash forums and help out here. In fact, we would love it if you did. It is the, the community there is really fantastic. It's, uh, it's, it's stellar. All right. And then lastly, from the forums anyway, we've got plenty more show to go for you, of course. Uh, lastly, from the forums, listener Joel says, uh, a bus buddy and I, as we commute together to work on the bus, uh, listen and play trivia, play a trivia prod podcast together on our commute. Cool. With iPhone 7 and the lightning only audio. He says, I find splitting the audio tedious since we both have recent iPhones. Is there a way to get two headphones connected to the iPhones without my current method of lightning to uh, analog audio to an analog audio splitter to two analog earbuds. It says most of the adapters that are dual lightning play audio through one and charge on the other. That is correct. Um, th there's a lot of these dual lightning adapters, but one of the ports is audio only. And one of the ports is charge only. So I looked around a bit and we kind of went back and forth on this. Uh, there is, I think it seems like there is something about lightning audio and the way it works on iOS devices that only one audio output can happen at a time. And where this really came home was when I found a three-way adapter, which has two lightning ports and one analog headphone jack. The lightning ports are, of course, one of them is charge only, the other is audio only, and then, of course, the analog headphone jack is also audio only. However, you can only use one of the two audio outputs at the same time. And I think that's because there is a digital to analog converter uh, happening either in the analog jack that's hap that's right in the adapter or past the lightning port to whatever you're choosing to plug in. Uh, and then, you know, that that DAC, the digital to analog converter is happening down the line. So, yeah, I am. 
it, it, it this is not a thing that's going to work. I think you've got to go back to your, you know, split the things or, you know, in this, you may or may not be comfortable doing this, but if you have a pair of AirPods, right, you could each put one in and listen that way. Uh, you could do the same with a single headphone, you know, split the earbuds and put one in. Of course, we've seen people do that too, but, uh, but you know, there's, there's, there's some proximity uh, requirements for that, but also, uh, you know, if, if you're worried about sharing, you know, ear germs and, and things like that, then that obviously that that's a bad path to, to head down. So very interesting, very limiting, but that's how it goes. Right, John? I suppose. Yeah. I almost, uh, I almost paired with some AirPods. I, I was on the train and I turned my phone on and I got a dialogue very quickly and then it went away Yeah, because there were actually two people next to me that had AirPods and I, I don't know why I thought that they should be paired, but, um, right. But yeah, that, that thing with the lightning is, uh, is disappointing because technically you should be able, I mean, you know, with like a different, as you said, a digital analog converter, apparently the one that they have in there only, they only, Got one that does one channel. It, well, no, I think it's that I think it's that iOS will only talk to one oh. DAC at a time, right? Because there oh, are two. Okay. You could have a scenario where there's two DACs connected, right? I mean, there's the one in the for the analog port on this, you know, on this three way device that we found, and then you would have another if, say, you plugged in, you know, your Lightning earpods or whatever. There's an analog, okay. right? There's a there's a DAC in there too. But yeah, I think it's that. Really, I think it's that like rogue amoeba can't write device level driver software for iOS and say, Hey, use two audio outputs or, or like, you know, on the Mac, you can, you don't even need something third party. You can go into audio MIDI setup and create an aggregate audio device. Right. But, but just like on, on the Mac where you go into system preferences and the sound, you would see, you know, two audio devices, you'd see the, the you know, built in output and then third party, you know, USB or whatever. And I'm sure iOS sees the same thing and it just auto selects only one of them. It doesn't just barf audio out everything, because otherwise, then if it did that, it wouldn't know where you wanted audio to go. And you would wind up with audio coming out of the speakers in the phone. And, you know, like it, we need we need that aggregate audio device. Uh, functionality added to the user interface of iOS and we're, we're not going to get it. I mean, it, it, it's a very limited use case. And in fact, I'm, I'm happily surprised that it's still around on the Mac, but, but it's got, mm -hmm. and obviously handy. Right. So I think, I think that's the issue is it's just selecting one at a time. And my guess is just like the Mac, it's fully capable of doing more than one at a time. There's just no way to tell it now that I think about it. Right. Sure. Sure. Cool. Hey, uh, let's talk about uh, let's talk about our next sponsor. Our next sponsor is LinkedIn Talent Solutions, LinkedIn Jobs at LinkedIn.com slash MGG, where you can get $50 off towards your first job post. Here's the thing. The right hire can make a huge impact on your business. And that's why it's so important to find the right person. Uh but where do you find that person, right? You could try posting on regular job boards, but can you really be sure the right person sees your job? Here's the thing, right? If instead you find the person on LinkedIn, because even people that aren't looking for jobs are still using LinkedIn. In fact, 70% of the U.S. workforce is already on LinkedIn and paying attention there, right? Right. LinkedIn's a place where you can go regardless of whether you're looking for a job or looking for, to hire someone, right? Like it's got its own social network component and people spend time there. This is the key, right? So LinkedIn jobs matches people to your role based on more about who they really are, their skills, their interests, and even how open they are to new opportunities. And this way your job gets seen by the right people. Because most LinkedIn members haven't recently visited a top job board, but nine out of 10 of them say they are open to new opportunities. Of course they are, right? If you got a good job, but a better opportunity comes along, you're going to consider that potentially. Well, so are other people. So here's the trick. Go to LinkedIn.com slash MGG. I did this, right? 
and, and, and when you go to linkedin.com slash MGG, you get $50 off towards your first job post. You may find your candidate and spend less than that $50, right? I, I, I've, I've been through this. I've done it. And you get quite a bit for your dollar there at LinkedIn Jobs. So check it out. LinkedIn.com slash MGG. You get $50 off towards your first job post. One more time. That's LinkedIn.com slash MGG. Of course, terms and conditions apply as always. Our thanks to LinkedIn for sponsoring this episode. Our next sponsor is a new sponsor for us, and it is Captera. We're at Captera.com, C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A.com slash M-G-G. You can go get the big book of free software for free downloaded. Again, visiting Captera.com slash M-G-G. You listen to this show because you like to find new software. You like to find that tool that's going to do what you want. Think about Captera as a huge library of cool stuff found that's indexed, right? Don't let finding the right software be one of the hurdles that you have to deal with, right? Again, that's why you listen to this show. One of the reasons you listen to this show to find out about stuff. But how about something that maybe we don't mention? Well, that's what Captera is. Captera.com is the free resource to help you find the software you need for whatever you need to do at home with your business. Maybe you got a side hustle, whatever it is. And with helpful information, their big book of free software can help you find a completely free tool to test today. And as I said, even getting the big book of free software is also free. So whether you're looking for like new project management tools, recruiting software, email marketing stuff, Captera's big book of free software has something for you. Visit captera.com slash MGG today to get your free copy of the big book of free software. Again, Captera is C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot com slash MGG. Our sincere thanks to Captera for sponsoring this episode. All right, John. It's time to talk about APFS and it's not all roses, man. Um, I, 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 I've got three questions queued up for this. I'm not sure how we're going to go through these, but um, you know, uh, here's, here's sort of the, the thing we now have had APFS running on, on max, not all max, of course, but, but, you know, SSD max uh, for over a year. And, we're starting to begin to see some of those things where sort of natural file system corruption comes into play. And there is no real, like there's no history. There's not enough history for third party tools to really be able to do the hard work of digging in. Yes, you can do some repairs and things like that, uh, but not all the repairs we would need to do. It's it's not as mature as HFS plus. And that means that the tools are also not as mature. In fact, far less so. So uh, Ron writes, he says, uh, he says, uh, I need advice. After listening to Mac Geek 730 last week's show, it reminded me that Mojave's install on my late 2012 Fusion iMac was behaving uh, in a similar manner to what you guys were describing, where things were a little wonky. He says, I tried the Mojave version of Onyx, which completely froze my computer. Then my journey began. The iMac froze while booting in safe mode, then booted into recovery partition with a wired keyboard. Disk utility fixed something. OK, so that's good. And he says, then the computer booted normally. This morning, it wouldn't wake from sleep and rebooting again froze in mid startup. He says, I went to verbose mode and saw some different things. Uh, he says uh, there were some APFS failure key or APFS key bag failures uh, just before it froze. There was also a uh, PCI pause SDXC uh, listed there. He says, my question is this. Bruce, in the last episode, mentioned he reinstalled APFS and then it did a clean install of Mojave. I wasn't sure how that would work on a fusion drive. My stuff is on Dropbox and iCloud and my pictures and the rest are cloned by super duper. He says, so I'm going to try it tonight and see. And, and this is uh, interesting. And, and what he wound up doing was reformatted his fusion, his APFS fusion drive, you know, he reformatted his fusion drive as APFS from scratch, not the migrated upgrade 
Uh, and he says, and I move things over from my super duper backup. And he says, everything is good. And he says, adding to this discussion, I ran into a similar situation last night with my Mac mini also with an APFS formatted slash upgraded SSD. It would start to boot, but the progress bar would get stuck at the end. Uh, it got stuck on this exact same PCI. Oh, wait, wait. I'm That's reading. Me. That's you. You ran into the same thing on your Mac Mini. All right. Tell, and you got stuck on the same PCI uh, pause SDXC line, John? So I went up, you know, I wanted to do a bit of gaming. Um, sure. Came upstairs, turned on, you know, fired, fired up the machine. Um. And the progress bar, when I booted it, stuck got stuck at the end. I'm like, well, what's 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 going on here? Or I think something. No, I'm sorry. So something froze, and and so I, uh, you know, held the power button, held that down, and then uh, rebooted, and it wouldn't. It, it, the progress bar got to the end, and that was it. And I'm like, uh, okay. So okay. I did a similar yeah. thing is, you know, I rebooted. I, I accidentally, actually, I thought, um, I'm like, oh, okay, well, it's not booting. Well, let me do um, a safe boot. And I held down command S, which uh, is actually single user mode. <laughs> but uh, it got right. me to the yeah, same safe place. Boot is is I, shift key, but right. Right. But, oh, but single user, or say, um, safe mode did, user, did not work, right? Well, in single user mode, what happened um as it turns out, I didn't try that. So in single user mode, it got stuck at the exact same spot. Uh, that whole PCI SDXC, which is you know the uh, secure digital uh, slot, um, but it got stuck at the exact same spot. And I'm like, oh great, now what do I do? And what I did was was similar: is that I went into recovery, ran disutility uh, once I mounted the uh, partition, and it complained about the snapshot index something or other and then the, the the last line though is it said uh you know deploying delayed fixes or something and then it booted just fine oh i guess the takeaway here is that going into recovery and running disutility um is something you may want to do so <laughs> every here's, now and then here's the thing right like so th i mean this is interesting right because now we're starting to hear about these and the fact that both you and ron had had similar like very that you had the same problem right um, is, is interesting. And, you know, here's the thing, man, your drive and Ron's drive originally were upgraded from HFS plus, right. And I've right. looked at HFS, like if you go in and you start doing like disk util list and you start looking uh, in the terminal at how these volumes are organized, APFS does a very different thing from HFS plus with HFS plus the drive is organized into partitions and those partitions are formatted and named and, and that's it, right? It, it's, it's pretty much, you know, the volume just lives on the partition that gets a little bit obscured when you run uh, file vault two, right? The whole disk encryption, because the way that works is it actually takes the partition and starts Kind of it, you go one level up from that and it starts creating some virtual logical partition or volumes there. It needs to create, obviously, the one with your data that's encrypted, but it also has to create a small one that's not encrypted so that it can load the software to decrypt the volume. Right. And, and so that needs to be there. So things get a little bit different with with the way core storage organizes it. Well, APFS takes this fully into everything is just virtual and logical volumes. I mean, not everything at some level. Yes, it's partitioned the drive, but generally APFS just partitions one big blob. And, uh, and then you have your logical volumes sort of, sort of mixed in there, but it looks very different when you have, if, if the, well, two things look different. If you, migrate from or convert a volume from HFS plus to APFS, that looks a whole lot more convoluted than if you format a drive as APFS to begin with, right? They're both con more convoluted than it used to be for sure. But formatting as APFS from scratch is a much cleaner disk structure 
than the migrated one from HFS plus because it's not actually erasing your HFS plus partition. It's sort of fitting the APFS structure into this thing that was created for a different file system. And that I think is problematic for some folks. And we'll talk about some other instances of this. Uh, in fact, let, let's with that in mind, let's let's get on to this. In fact, we'll go to we'll go to Adam. And we'll talk about some of the stuff he's done and why there might be a really good argument to clone your drive and format it as APFS from scratch and then just clone back to it. You don't necessarily need to do a full nuke and pave where you're reinstalling the OS, but that part of the nuke and pave that starts a fresh volume on APFS for you may well be something very handy um and here we go with uh with adam adam says uh i have a 13 inch uh 2011 macbook pro that is just my play machine but it is they're both running high sierra uh from third-party f ssds and all upgraded slash formatted to apfs the macbook pro is just a play machine he says i wanted to try installing mojave on it using DOS Dude One's install patcher. So this is DOS Dude One's install patcher is a way of getting um, Mojave onto machines that that might not run Mojave. Uh, but he didn't get that far. I don't think that's his uh, his 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 issue here. He says, uh, but I wanted to make a full backup first to an external three and a half inch uh, you know USB three drive. He says so. I tried booting into recovery mode and using disk utility to restore the SSD to the external to make a bootable backup. Okay, smart. He's going to do some funky stuff. He wants a clone first. No problem. That failed for some reason. So he says I decided to break out the one Thunderbolt cable I cable I have and put the MacBook Pro into target disk mode and plug it into my Mac Mini. I would then plug the external into the Mac mini and use carbon copy cloner on the Mac mini to clone from the target disk mode attached MacBook Pro to this other USB drive. Perfect. When I opened the MacBook Pro's icon on the desktop, all I saw was a single file. He says, I forget the name that said it was some 200 plus gigs in size. I thought this isn't right. And I ejected the volume and then unplugged and powered off the laptop. When I booted the laptop back up, I got the symbol for no bootable volume found. Uh-oh. Reboot with the option held down, R held down, no recovery partition available. He says, I tried again with Command R to get to the network recovery going. And when I got into disk utility there, the SSD was listed, good news, in the side column in bright red. And when I clicked on it, it said that the device was now damaged. I should recover what files I can and replace the drive. Is this some new security self-destruct feature that I don't know about? No, I don't think so. You hadn't done anything wrong. Uh, this is, I don't think the MacBook Pro is encrypted. Even if it was, how could this possibly destroy a physical drive with no moving parts like this? All I did was plug it in Thunderbolt for target disk mode. It says, can I just reformat the SSD and rebuild? Or is this thing actually toast? He says, I have another spinning drive that I can put in there along with the time machine backup that I can restore from. But what do you think happened? So, uh, you know, my first reaction was at, in reading this was, OK, well, maybe the Mac mini didn't understand APFS containers uh, and that's the issue. But of course, he says that he's running High Sierra on the Mac mini and, and it's booting from APFS. So that gets thrown out the window. The Thunderbolt cable would be the next likely target. But again, like if that were the case, I think it wouldn't show up at all. It wouldn't show up as some weird volume. I mean, that would take a pretty special bit of damage to a cable, right, John, to make it display the wrong thing as opposed to no thing. But that 200 gig file he saw, I think, is almost certainly his data container. And as I mentioned, that's the thing about core storage, right, is that everything's a container. And so I wonder if this volume was, you know, mildly corrupted before you did anything here. Right. And just these this alternative mounting process or maybe the, the attempt to clone it with disk utility or something just kind of pushed it over the edge. There's, there's no way to, to know. We can't go back in time. Um, but without there being, you know, third party disk utilities, as we mentioned, I, I, I don't know that there's anything to do other than exactly what you suggested, which is just reformat the drive and restore from a backup. Um, 
Because I don't think the hardware is damaged. I, I don't think any of the things that he did would would be. I mean, it's possible the hardware could have just died on its own coincidentally, but I don't think anything he did would have would have caused it. And as it turns out, we've heard back, and and that's exactly the case. He was able to reformat, and everything was good. So, thoughts on this, John? Interesting, because when <clears throat> when I had my situation and I repaired the uh, the volume, when I yeah. went back to this utility. I didn't see my volume. I saw two individual partitions and I'm like, Oh, that's not good. Did it make matters worse? But when I rebooted, everything seemed to be fine. So that struck me as kind of bizarre that. Hmm. Know what I'm saying it, 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 not, not the exact situation, but a similar situation Yeah. Is that, is that I wasn't seeing what I expected, but a reboot. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you on this. I, yeah, it's, um, it, well, I, again, I think, you know, so here's the thing, regardless of the reason APFS drives, like every drive before and after are going to suffer from file system corruption at some point, right? Something's going to happen. That's going to cause it. It's just, you know, we've seen it in every file system ever. It's just a, kind of a fact of life. If things don't shut down exactly the right way or, you know, something wonky happens, then you wind up in that scenario. And without robust tools to fix it, um, I think we're going to find ourselves certainly for the next few years in a scenario r routinely where the answer is, yep, uh, you know, clone it. Hopefully you already have a clone format, restore the clone. You're good to go. Uh, especially these drives that have this additional layer of complexity having been migrated from HFS plus to APFS. So I know we preach backups here all the time. Um, I would implore you, especially now if you're running APFS to do those backups more deliberately, more robustly, because otherwise, I don't know, it's not good. It's not good. It's not good. So there you go. Um, and I would, you know, ahead of time, uh, I would create a boot disk, a USB boot stick for Mojave, if that's your main OS, or if not, you know, for High Sierra, if that's your main OS on your Mac, and keep those aside, because that might be the thing. I mean, if you're cloning your drive, in theory, now you've got a boot drive anyway but that troubleshooting tool of having that installer and boot disk available to use anywhere you know we talked about this last week creating that linux boot disk right um i i would i would definitely even before you create the linux boot disk uh, as your troubleshooting tool i would definitely create a usb stick for mojave or high sierra whatever you know whatever your your um whatever your system actually is using uh, i think that's that's more important now than ever. And Apple has an article about creating, um, creating, a, you know, an installer, uh, a boot disk. You download the installer and then you use some terminal magic to, to like beam that over in a bootable way to a, to a USB stick. Or if you really want to just make life easier and there's no reason not to, uh, you can use disk maker X, uh, I think it's disk maker 10, but it's at DiskMakerX.com, and that will create you a, uh, a bootable, you know, stick, which I made mine the other day as we were, as, as we were prepping this show, John, because, uh, yeah, man, it's not good. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think I should make one too. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad you mentioned the, um, um, the Apple way of doing it. Cause before they didn't make it easy at all to make a bootable uh right right bootable stick but yeah as you mentioned now you can do it from the terminal yeah i'll just find a you have to find a usb stick <laughs> uh yeah my guess is that you've got hundreds of them in your drawers from all these press events yes. we go to yeah i yes. think i think for high sierra and mojave i don't think a four gig usb stick is quite big enough it might be but certainly an eight gig stick is is plenty and those are relatively inexpensive these days too. So, oh, okay, because they, um, yeah, I think 
What was the? I mean, the guidance was that I, I think it was around four gigs because that was typically the size of a, of a DVD, right? Single layer DVD, so they tried to keep it below that. But yeah, I, it's possible a four gig would work. Um, but I, I I think the Mojave downloader was like four point seven or something like that. That, but um, but yeah, Brian Monroe is is in our chat room at macgeekgab.com slash stream is saying an eight gig stick is good for both Mac OS and windows 10 booting. He says plus four gig sticks are getting harder and harder to find now. So my drawer is full of four gig sticks, but, uh, but there you go. There you go. All right. Uh, where are we here on time? Oh, okay, good. Oh, we're cooking along. This is, uh, we're actually, we're, but anyway, we're at the 50 minute mark as those of you who are looking at your clocks can see it's it's not quite as far along as, as i thought we were which means we have more time for good stuff one good thing that i would like to do is thank all of our mac geek gab premium subscribers at macgeekgab.com slash premium is where you can go if you are interested and of course able to offer you know direct financial support for the show we certainly appreciate it uh it is not mandatory it is not necessary in order for you to be a valued member of our community, there's lots of things you can do. Of course, you can visit the Mac Geek Gab forums at macgeekgab.com slash forums. You can send in your questions. You can help answer questions. Uh, you know, there's lots that you can do to participate and it all matters, right? Without all of it, uh, this show doesn't exist the way that it currently does. But there is a component of this where your direct financial support truly, truly helps. And that's why we want to take a minute and thank everyone. So this actually in the past two weeks uh, on the monthly $10 plan, we have had uh, support and now offer our thanks. So thanks to John B, Elizabeth B, Ward J, Olga P, Bob P, Michael L, Jason A, Stephen A, Christopher S at uh, a monthly $20 contribution, not just 10. <clears throat> Paul M, Mike C, Mark R, Chris F, Bob L at Working Smarter for Mac Users, Dr. Mac. Ryan M, Neil L, Scott F, Dave C, John G, James C, J C, Frank A, Joe S, Abdullah B, Ari L, and Barry F. So thanks to all of you. On the $25 every six month plan. We have Keith K, Ulysses B, John B, Ken K, Mario Z, John G, Ken L, Paul K, Ralph F, David C, Chris H, Kurt T, Bob H, James N, Robin J, Rob W, Colby W, Mark W, no relation amongst any of them, Donald S, and Andy D at 25 every six months. Thanks to all of you. And then at 50 every six months, we have Dominic D and Lawrence H. So thanks to you. And a one-time contribution of 30 from Mike C. Thanks. To, really, thanks to everybody. It, uh, it really does make a difference. It allows us to do a lot of different things that we couldn't do otherwise. And um, we really appreciate it. So thanks, you folks. Rock. All right, John. Um, I want to talk briefly well uh, maybe maybe this will be less than brief about uh this new I, I i you know i test new routers all the time and uh i like to kind of push the envelope uh you know we've talked a lot about mesh and we will continue to talk a lot about mesh but for many people a standalone router is uh the right thing if you if you can get it in a spot in your home where the router is powerful enough to just get your whole home then you don't need mesh and some people like a router with a lot of functionality. You know, we often talk about the Synology router because of the functionality that it provides for geeks like us. Well, there are other routers like that. And this week I had the opportunity to check out Netgear's new XR700 gaming router. So this is an interesting piece of gear. It is a tri-band router, John. Uh, and I will put an asterisk on the third band because we'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, but it is a four by four router. It is one of the fastest standalone routers and with the best range that I've ever seen. These four by four routers make a huge difference in terms of their range because they're able to really kind of tune their antennas in and pick the right antennas to talk to your device. So when I say four by four, what I mean is that there are four streams going out and going in on each of the three bands. Now, your iPhone 
is a two by two device, which means there are two streams going in and out. So it can only connect to two of the four on, on a router like this. But the cool part is the router gets to help it pick which two of the four and the antennas are kind of aimed and tuned a little differently so that you're picking the right, uh, the right two of the four that helps cut through interference that helps with range. Uh, it really does make a difference. I was able to get from across my house, um, 500 megabits per second, uh, on my iPhone, which is crazy fast, uh, especially for the distance. And especially given that my house at the time had three, if not four other complete wireless mesh systems up and running layered on top and, and competing for available spectrum with each other. So the fact that this thing was able to just cut through and, and do that is pretty crazy. The cool part is that this router, because it's a gaming router has some additional features, John, and it's got uh, Netgear has their Nighthawk pro gaming Duma OS D U M A. And it does some cool stuff. So it's got QoS, which, of course, you know, you, you definitely want for a lot of things. But gaming, it really matters for it's got um, it's got a VPN server. So you could VPN into your house. It also has on the outbound, John, what's called a hybrid VPN. And this is pretty cool. So you can you know, you'd have to sign up for some third party VPN provider or set up your own somewhere else. And then you connect your router to it. You put in the credentials so it will connect to the VPN. And then the way the reason they call it hybrid VPN is because you certainly can choose to have your entire network uh, of data sent across the VPN. But with hybrid, you can choose to have only specific devices or specific traffic. So let's say that you're totally fine with, you know, using your VPN for you want to use it for security. So you, you know, you set up with this VPN, you send everything across it. But Netflix doesn't like it when you connect with a VPN. Hulu doesn't like it when you connect with a VPN. Maybe. Right. Fine. No problem. You go in and you say, great. I don't want Netflix traffic to be sent across this VPN or I don't want my gaming traffic sent across a VPN because it slows things down. Right. It adds another layer. It's pretty cool how you're able to just do this, or you can do the opposite. You can say, don't send any of my traffic over the VPN, except these couple of things. So maybe you're somewhere where you do want to use a VPN with Netflix and you find one that works and it allows you to get your Netflix content from, you know, your home country while you're traveling somewhere else. Okay. No problem. Right. It can do that. Uh, if you're somebody who likes to use BitTorrent, uh, no judgment here, but you certainly might want to send your BitTorrent traffic across a VPN so that your ISP doesn't uh, send you nasty letters, right? That could also be done. Uh, it's a pretty cool thing. And, and then, John, because this also matters to gaming people, you can actually tell it to only allow you to connect to servers in a certain geographic area so that you are insured getting low ping times and it will actually block. You can say, okay, cool. I'm going to play, you know, call of duty or whatever. Great. I want to only connect to servers within, you know, a uh, thousand kilometers of me so that you, you know, you're physically close to them. You get lower latency and all that stuff. You can actually do all of that stuff too. So it's just pretty cool, right? I mean, it like this is a, a cool thing. And if you're a gamer, this is exactly the kind of thing that you'd want. And then John. So any questions on that, John, before I before I open up the next can of worms here? Open away. Okay. I didn't even realize this when I asked to test this router, but the third band on this, normally when we talk about tri-band routers, we have a 2.4 gigahertz radio and then two five gigahertz radios, right? And those both can be used for 802.11ac. Um, a lot of times, especially with a router that's gaming focused, you would want to not have those all use the same SSID so that your second five gigahertz band can be dedicated only for your, you know, your one gaming device so that it it's not sharing the the pipe with any other devices, all that stuff. This one has a 2.4 gigahertz radio, a 5 gigahertz radio, and a 60 gigahertz radio, John. And that 60 gigahertz radio uses something called 
802.11 AD. Now, great. Yet another Wi-Fi standard to think about, right? Here's the thing. So we've seen 802.11 AD before. You know, it's been floated around. We've, we've run into it at various press events and CESs and things like that. It uses 60 gigahertz. Now, uh, in a nutshell, as you increase the frequency, you get the opportunity for more bandwidth, more data at a shorter range. And when you, if you might remember when five gigahertz came out, you know, when we were talking about 802.11 AC over five gigahertz, it was like, well, but it won't go through walls. And of course, we've proven that to be wholly untrue in most homes. If you've got plaster, it's, it's pr probably pretty true. But otherwise, in most homes, you know, with, with just, you know, studs and sheetrock and stuff, it, it's, it's fine. Uh, this is almost certainly going to be true with 802.11 AD, right? It's 60 gigahertz. Uh, it's really just meant for that one room. But again, for a gaming setup, this sort of makes sense. But 802.11 AD doesn't make a lot of sense, I don't think, for most scenarios. It is not backwards compatible. Like that radio is unusable to me because that is the only AD device I have in the house, John. So I can't test it. I can't even tell you. I have no way of looking to see if it's even broadcasting a signal. I'm, I'm assuming it is. Uh, the rest of the router works as advertised. I would assume this part does too. But I have no way of testing that, right? Speeds on AD, uh, they say that, you know, we're probably going to get somewhere in the five to seven gigabit range. That's really fast. But again, you probably wouldn't use all that bandwidth, but just having that spectrum available allows for better speeds. So 802.11 AD is in the market. It's actually been in the market for a little while. Probably a non-starter for most people. However, John, that doesn't mean that we're stopping with 802.11 AC. In fact, 802.11 AX is, uh, is probably something that we will begin to see pretty quickly in 2019. And as you may have heard, it also has another name. And that other name is Wi-Fi 6. Okay. The Wi-Fi or the IEEE Wi-Fi Alliance has decided in their infinite wisdom that thinking about, you know, 802.11b and G and N and AC and AD and AX is uh, confusing for people because it's confusing for people. So they have decided to rename Wi-Fi. So we're going all the way back to 802.11b, which is now Wi-Fi 1, 802.11a, which came out basically at the same time as B, is Wi-Fi 2. 802.11G, which we most of us used, uh, you know, 10 years ago or so, is, is Wi-Fi 3. 802.11N, which works, so the first three, well, actually B is 2.4 gigahertz, A is 5 gigahertz, G is 2.4, N is either 2.4 or 5, so that's Wi-Fi 4. And then 802.11AC, Again, all of these backwards compatible with each other, at least if you support the, the, the radios involved. Uh, 802.11ac, which we've had for the last, you know, whatever, three or four years, the thing that opened up mesh and all that. 802.11ac is Wi-Fi 5. So we are currently at Wi-Fi 5 with most devices. And Wi-Fi 6, also known as 802.11ax, is coming next year. Now, why is why is 802.11ax or Wi-Fi 6 better than AD? AD doesn't have a Wi-Fi number, by the way, if that's any indication as to what the Wi-Fi Alliance thinks of its future. Uh, what's the difference? Well, the difference is that Wi-Fi 6, a.k.a. AX, uses both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz and does some additional, some different signaling in order to increase its bandwidth, um, the best there's two ways to to two analogs to this. One is LTE, right? LTE changed the way it was using signaling over the radio in order to fit more bandwidth into the same pipe. Cable modems. We've talked a lot about the difference between DOCSIS 3.0 and DOCSIS 3.1. Same cable using a different signaling method called OFDMA, multiple access. Uh, you can fit more bandwidth by chopping up 
the spectrum into smaller bits and sending more across simultaneously. OFDMA is what allows your DOCSIS 3.1 cable modem to go up to gigabit speeds. It is also what allows Wi-Fi 6 to go much, much faster. In the lab, they've got it going 11 gigabits. In real world, again, we're probably going to see something in that 4 to 7 gigabit per second range uh, just because you can't use all the spectrum in real world that you actually can in the lab, not realistically. So, yeah. And again, you know, are we going to be sending data at those speeds? Well, I mean, Ethernet in most homes is, you know, a gigabit is the max, right? So, no. But again, having that spectrum available makes a big difference in terms of extended range uh, and all of that. And because it, Wi-Fi 6 uses both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, well, then, uh, you know, you'll get at least the same range that you get with Wi-Fi 5 and maybe even faster. Yay, we got through the Wi-Fi 5 to 6 discussion. So, thoughts on any of this, John? Uh, 160 megahertz channels, right? Well, maybe. I don't think and, you mentioned that. Well, I that, thought I, that was... Uh, I, I, I'm poking around and I, and I found a that. reference to I skipped that. Channel. Yeah, so that you can... I mean, you can do 160 megahertz channels with, with Wi-Fi 5 now, 802.11ac. Most things do not. Most things use 80 megahertz channels. And that's where the difference between on Wi-Fi 6, that's where the difference between that 11 mega, 11 gigabits per second versus the, you know, four to seven comes in because 11, they're using 160 megahertz channels. But in real world, we're probably not going to be doing that, you know, realistically, just mm -hmm. like we can't with, with Wi-Fi 5. So it's, that's why it's going to be a little slower. So it's going to be 80 megahertz channels in, in mm -hmm. most use cases. That's right. Yep. Yeah. But there's potential. Mm. There is. It, but it, it, I mean, have you ever tried to use 160 gigahertz channels? It's really difficult to get your router to <laughs> to to use like that big, huge swath of bandwidth. I mean, I've I used to try it years ago when AC first came out and we could install like DDWRT on our routers and really tweak everything. And you could turn it on and then the router would come back. The radio would come back and say, uh, yeah, there, there's too much interference. I, I'm, I'm back down to 80. So I, it like, it's just not going to happen. And that was when most people didn't have five gigahertz radios. <laughs> so yeah, I don't, I don't think it's realistic to use 160 megahertz channels, but, uh, but still 80 megahertz using this new signaling method is going to make us easily get gigabit speeds, gigabit plus multi gigabit speeds over Wi-Fi. And then the nice part is, it, you know, so uh, you know, once they put this in phones and things like that, which I really think they will, I think, I think Wi-Fi six is, is where it's going. Not, not this AD thing, but, um, but it's interesting. It's fun. And I'm really glad that, that we've got these new names. We will, we will routinely refer to them both for a little while just to help us all, not just you, but us too remember what where the translation layer is so that when we're thinking and we run across a router that was built you know before october of 2018 and doesn't say a wi-fi number it just has a protocol on it you'll know how to translate that so we'll 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 keep reinforcing this lesson together how's that sound john good good yeah i'm excited about about this this is cool stuff um that's, and I've got a, I've got some other routers to test. I always have routers to test. It's crazy. It's a little bit nuts. Yeah. Well, um, one that I think you'll be testing is uh, the one that Synology. You can actually buy it now. So right. I think you talked about the uh, the software and all that, but they uh, they actually uh, officially announced the release of it. And I, I just checked now. If you go to uh, Amazon, you can actually uh, purchase it. But it's you're, talk their, uh, you're talking about the MR twenty two hundred AC mesh router. Correct. Yes. Yep. Yeah. 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 No, this is it. Like, this is what we talked about last week. And I'm, I'm stoked about it because I really like the feature set that Synology offers. And I'm really, I'm curious from, uh, you know, uh, I've got one of these on the way. Actually, I think I've got a couple of them on the way. Uh, you can add them as mesh points to either your Synology router system. If you have a, you know, the, the latest RT 2600 AC from Synology, or you can add them to your existing router. This is that whole, you know, mesh 2.0 thing we were talking about last week. And I think in the latter scenario, 
it adds, it brings in some of those features, this, this MR 2200 AC from Synology. If you've got a router that you like, or you're stuck with because it's from your ISP and you can't change, but you want some of these Synology features, I think like cloud station and some of these others are supported independently on this new device from Synology. So you can add a mesh point that does some meshing and also adds these features while still keeping your existing router. So I, I'm interested in testing from a lot of angles. It's, this is like, like I said last week, this is exciting, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. You got to see the thing, right, John, at the Synology event this week. Yeah. They, uh, yeah, they had it displayed and they showed the, uh, you know, they showed the interface, which is uh, similar to uh, their existing products or, or you know, the same uh, uh, OS. It's well, it's similar. I mean, it's it's SRM, not DSM. So it's Synology Router Manager, not Synology, not Disk Station Manager. But um, but yeah, it, I mean, if you're comfortable with Synology's Disk Stations, you know, user interface, their web interface, then you're totally good to go with this. It it it's the same, which is awesome. It's really, yeah, I'm excited, man. It's, I, I'm just excited about it all. I, I don't know why Wi-Fi makes me so happy. I, you, know what make, you know why it makes me happy? Because I have a family of, well, now three in the house, but um, a family of four, we all really use our Wi-Fi regularly. And I love it when everything just works and it's smooth even though I've got, you know, two kids streaming Netflix in different places and, you know, we're streaming to our Apple TV in the living room or whatever. And my son's playing games on the PlayStation downstairs or the Xbox. We don't have PlayStation. Why did I say that? But we have an old PlayStation, but he's on the Xbox now. And, you know, and, and I'm podcasting and it used to be that, you know, if my wife started uploading pictures while we were doing a podcast, I had to pause the show and like text her and be like, Oh, Hey, hey, least please don't, you know, and we've solved all these problems and it like now it just works. Of course, because I'm me, that's not okay. That's not good enough. Now I want to break it until I fix it again or fix it until I break it, whatever it is. But anyway, it's fun. So yeah, I'm excited. It's good. you got a similar setup. I mean, it, I know it's just you at your house, but you like, you do a lot with, beaming data around and backups and bandwidth and streaming to your TV. And you don't want it to stutter ever for anybody, you or anybody else. Right. No. And, uh, yeah. And with the, uh, the three, uh, three euros, um, pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Just looking here with, uh, yeah, I see. What do I see here? Yeah. So I have a 80 megahertz channel at five gigahertz and 20 megahertz at 2.4. Cool. That's good. Not all my devices talk AC, but hey. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. I like this stuff. All right. Well, we'll talk more. I'm sure we'll talk more about it. Where are we? We're here. Uh, should we Should we answer a couple of questions, John? Or should we? I think we should blow through some cool stuff found, but I'm, but I'm open. You choose, my friend. Cool. Go for the cool. Cool. Okay. Cool. Uh, we will start with Scott. Uh, who was just listening to episode 726 and says you were talking about cloud storage for cheap long-term storage. Uh, he says, I suggest looking at wasabi.com. Other than the wonderful taste of wasabi, the wasabi.com service is compatible to Amazon, but cheaper. Even better, they don't charge egress fees to get to your data. In fact, all they charge for is storage space. Check it out. He says uh, it's been working, working very well for me. And uh, I, I looked into this. I haven't signed up yet, but uh, Wasabi, it, it's S3 compatible in terms of just the way their their infrastructure works and, and the way you can sort of plug into it with various pieces of software. But uh, it's $4.99 a terabyte per month. And as he said, no data transfer fees. So with Amazon's, you know, S3, you wind up paying for bandwidth too in, in a lot of cases. But well, with this, it's five bucks a, or four ninety nine. You know, five bucks a terabyte a month. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I am, I am becoming. I don't know. You know, this whole thing with Backblaze. I know that Backblaze has fixed their uh, their app now, so that it's far more Mojave compatible. But um, this whole thing has sort of left me with a sour taste. Like, do I really want to have my cloud backups all? Um, 
kind of, you know, kind of owned by one entity, like, wouldn't it be better if I was running software here, you know, and, and I'm thinking of like ARC by Haste or ARQ by, by Haystack software, right. And, and then just beaming to a data provider and kind of, kind of controlling the whole widget myself. I realize this is a geeky solution and not the all in one, but after, you know, the crash plan thing where they, you know, sort of abandoned their consumer market, it's like, yeah, maybe there's a better way. I don't know. I got to, uh, I got to think. And this wasabi thing makes me think. So it's good. Pretty good. Right, John? Yeah. I don't do too much cloud outside of by cloud. Hmm. We should. Yeah, right. Well, that's the thing is, yeah, we probably should. I agree. Uh, all right. Who is next here? James uh, sends in a note about the SanDisk iExpand base for iPhone, which looks like a, a Qi charging puck, but is not, right? Uh, but... It does have some interesting things in it. It's got a, uh, you know, you just plug in your lightning cable into this thing. It will charge from there for you. But, and it will fast charge with up to 15 watts of power, it says. Uh, but it's also got a 64 gig uh, storage inside it, right? So it charges your phone, it backs it up, all of that stuff. So you can do your backups locally, and own your own data and all of that stuff. So you plug this thing into the wall, you plug your, you know, your phone into it, and uh, then you use the SanDisk app and off you go. And James says he has it and likes it. And so thank you, James, for sending that along. Good, good stuff. Fun. I like it. Yeah, I remember seeing that at a prior show. Huh. Yeah. So it looks like you need a cable. Uh, though it looks like, yeah, it's not doing the data transfer wirelessly. It's doing it with the, you need a cable. You need a cable. Yes, exactly. Right. And and no charging oh. wireless. No, nothing wireless about this. That's right. Uh, while talking about backups, Curtis reminds us of Duplicati. He says Duplicati is an open source piece of backup software. It is block based, uses compression and strong encryption. It can store data locally on a hard drive or an SSD or your NAS. It can also upload to cloud services like Dropbox and B2. Yes, it does work with Wasabi. I checked into that. Um, he says, I've been testing it for about a week with a limited backup set of about 10 gigs from my MacBook Air. He says, I'm using box.com as my destination and it's working reliably so far with scheduled backups once per day. I've done a restore operation with a few files just to see how it works. Everything, configuration, scheduling, restoration is done via a local browser-based interface. He says, I think it's comparable to Backblaze, but being open sourced, you get uh, to know exactly what's going on. You just get to pick what you're doing. So we will uh, we will put that in the show notes, too. I know we've talked about that before, but uh, great stuff. So thank you. Good, 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 good. I like it. I like options. I got it. I remember checking out Duplicati, John, and um, I don't know. I, it was I, I didn't dig deeper, but that's we must. Uh, let's see. James. You know, lots of us have been updating our Apple watches. Those of us that can, I'm actually, I say us, I'm not in that group because I can't run the latest watch OS because I am still on my series zero that I got on day one, but, uh, he's, oh, there it is, John, <laughs> they're coming to get us. Uh, he says, uh, James writes, I tried this tip, uh, updating to the latest watch OS 5.1 and was able to update way faster than I ever have in the past. So the trick is. Your Apple Watch will attempt to update over Bluetooth. And Bluetooth is slower than Wi-Fi. But you can trick it if you hold your mouth just right and take the steps in the right order. So the steps are open the Apple Watch app on your iPhone. Go to My Watch Settings General Software Update. This is how you would update your watch. Great. Tap on Download and Install, which downloads the latest software to your phone and then begins the process of putting it on your, on your watch. When you see a time estimate in place of time remaining, then open the settings app on your iPhone and turn off Bluetooth. You got to do it in the settings app. Turn off Bluetooth. Go back to the Apple Watch app and tap cancel on the reconnect your Apple Watch message because it's going to be mad that you turned off Bluetooth. Now, complete the update process. That's it. Just let it complete. 
and then go back afterwards and turn Bluetooth on to reestablish a Bluetooth connection to your phone. Uh, to your watch, rather. This will force the Apple Watch to connect to your iPhone over Wi-Fi, and uh, it goes much faster. So we will we will put a link in the show notes to an article at brothertech.com where uh, where James found this little tip. So very, very cool. Thanks, man. I like that. It makes sense, too. Bluetooth is super handy, obviously, but also, you know, slow. Uh, in the forums, John, Alex mentioned something that I will definitely call cool stuff found. It was as part of an answer and it is disc arbitrator. And, uh, he says this was, uh, this was in terms of he, somebody wanted in the forums wanted to set their uh, volume on their Mac to not mount at startup. And Disk Arbitrator, it's it's free. It's available via GitHub, and it uh, it says normally it's you can use it to prevent a disk from mounting or to to mount as read only, so you can't write to it. Um, he says it's totally useful for running forensics on a dying disk, so that you're not you know mounting it in the wrong way. Really, really cool stuff. So super handy utility um, to you know mount disks or disk images, and uh, yeah. So there you go. A new new piece of troubleshooting uh, software that you can go grab. And we'll put a link to the to that in the show notes, too. So thanks, Alex, for posting that in the forums. That's awesome. Very good. Uh, two more cool stuff's found, John, unless you have a thought about Disk Arbitrator. No, I have to, I have to give it a whirl. I know. Same. Yeah. Uh, I recently was able to check out this new mic stand. You know, I, I podcast here in the studio, and I also routinely in fact podcast from my desk down in the office because when we record uh, tmo's daily observations when jeff has me as a guest on that show i uh, obviously you know i have to have to be there and so i have a different mic i actually have a rode podcaster connected usb to my mac there it's a great dynamic mic really easy to use and uh, i had previously been using some you know 12 dollar clip onto your desk um mic stands i have a a, a standing sitting desk down in my office so I can raise it or lower it as I choose. So I do a clip on mic stand so that it is, my mic is always sort of right at the right height and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, these $12 clamp on mic stands that you get from Amazon are fine. Uh, they do work. They are reliable, but they're not really elegant and they're a little janky. Uh, enter the new blue compass mic stand that clamps onto your desk uh it has this beautiful boom arm it's much longer than uh, i've ever seen before in one of these clamp on stands and that's because it's a little more robust it can support itself better my desk supports it just fine you grab it you move it to a new location and it just stays there it's like magic you know it's like the for those of you uh kids you might have to ask your parents the the old lampshade imac where you could move the screen around and wherever you put it it just stayed same thing happens with this blue compass mic stand. You just kind of grab the mic, put it where you want it, and it just stays right there. You don't have to like, you know, unscrew and rescrew and tighten and all that stuff. You just get it set up and you're good to go. So uh, <clears throat> we'll put a link to that in the show notes, but I've been really impressed with that thing down at the desk. So very, very happy now. Uh, things just work the way they're supposed to. Yeah. Questions, John, before we do our last cool stuff found? All right, cool. Well, our last cool stuff found also comes from, we started with the forums and we're going to end the show with the forums. Uh, Sync Folders Pro is, uh, is the cool stuff found. It comes from a question where somebody was asking about uh, syncing, you know, docs and uh, documents and desktop to iCloud, but wanting to be able to really control it. And Sync Folders Pro is the key there. Listener Michael participated in the forums and, and showed us this because, you know, the problem is with iCloud, you wind up where it sometimes will optimize your storage for you, even if you don't tell it to. And you're sort of stuck with this sort of very generic on and off switch. But Sync Folders Pro, Pro, Sync Folders Pro Gives you the option of really managing and tweaking and all of that stuff. So thank you, Michael, for shouting out to that. Have you ever used Sync Folders Pro, John? 
No, no. Hmm. Yes. Uh, it, you know, he says uh, it does exactly what's wanted here. It syncs between Mac and iCloud automatically or manually without deleting from one place or the other, depending on the syncing mode selected. So, again, very granular control over that. And again, it use it will use iCloud as its storage, if you like. So you don't even have to change that, which is pretty darn cool. And because it's doing a sync, the files are just their files. There's no. You know, it's not storing them as things that have to be read by Sync Folders Pro on another computer or whatever. It's just iCloud. You're good to go, which I really like. So there you go. Good stuff, Mr. Braun. Good, good yeah, stuff. I'm using, yeah, I use Synology. Yeah. Kind of, kind of Sync. And actually, I did recently have a hiccup with it. Hmm. I've been really happy with uh, Cloud Station Sync and and now Drive Sync, which is Synology's uh, syncing thing. Like that, that's great because I control all the data everywhere, and it it works really well. And then I just back it up. Yeah, so. maybe I should move to that because I'm using what they call Cloud Station Backup. I, I use both. Uh, I use Cloud Station Backup for my local backups, but that's a little wonkier. Like it, I found it less reliable. It works for a little while, and then it it just stops working, and you have to. Like, well, I just had that. Hoops. Is that's what you yeah, had? No, okay, yeah. No, I had it happen. Uh, but yeah, all of a sudden, you know, I was looking at the status of it. Um, you know, here's a tip, folks: make sure that your backups are actually running. Yeah. Because <laughs> I looked at it, and it's like, uh, yeah, the last time I synced was on a uh, ten uh, four, and I'm like, um, it's it's later than that. It's ten fourteen or ten fifteen. Yeah, exactly. And the error was something like can't find destination. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? It's right there. That's exactly what I had, too. I had to start from scratch to get it. Like, I tried yeah. everything. Yeah. Yeah. But but the cloud station sync. So, it's, you know, two di completely different products, but named very, very similar. Cloud station sync or um, now it's just called Synology Drive. Uh, that has worked really well for me, like super reliable for the last five years. So I've been really happy with that. That's my Dropbox slash, you know, iCloud replacement. So, yeah. Coolio. All right, folks. Well, that brings us to the end of yet another fun week here at Mac Geek Gab land. Feedback at MacGeekGab.com is the address that you can write to if you have a question, a tip, right? Sure. Um, for that other guy, though, they, they may want to send something to feedback at MacGeekGap.com. Right. And and if you're not in the first two groups, definitely feedback at MacGeekGap.com is going to be for you. Unless you're in the fourth, slightly separate group, but still the same. Uh, you, because you're a premium member, you can write us at premium at MacGeekGap.com. And we do check that box more frequently and and first because you know it's how it works but we do really the secret is we attempt to and most weeks do get to and answer everything that comes in even if we don't include it in the show we definitely go through it all it helps us kind of take a pulse and you know like that whole APFS thing this week I mean, it was really weird that so many of you and it turns out us we're having APFS problems. In fact, I think I'm having an APFS problem on this machine up here in the studio, too. So I might do that clone and restore to uh, to get life back in order up here. So, Yes, good stuff. Uh, you can visit us on the forums at, as we said, MacGeekGab.com slash forums. It is so great to have you all there. Really, really working out well. And uh, I want to thank, of course, all of you for listening. I want to thank Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. I want to thank everybody in our podcast marketplace. Of course, our sponsors, BB Edit from Bare Bones, Captera.com slash MGG, LinkedIn.com slash MGG, Smile at SmileSoftware.com slash podcast, Ring at Ring.com slash MGG. Fun stuff, folks. Fun, fun stuff. Looks like the band's getting louder, John. I think we timed it perfectly. I started us off here, my friend. Why don't you? Uh, why don't you be the one to wrap it up? What's the? Uh, what's the last little tidbit we're going to share for this week? I don't want to wrap it up. I want to open a present, but <laughs> you got to be careful when you're opening a present because you don't want to get caught. 
Maynard.